Thanks so much for that introduction, Diane. And welcome again to all of you for this event and to, to all of our guest speakers, our panelists. It's such an honor to be hosting this event in conjunction with Central Vermont Refugee Action Network and to welcome you all to the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. So we'll go ahead and um, get our evening started. We have um, a nice lineup of speakers here who have a lot to share from their personal and professional experience on these issues relating to refugees and migrant workers in Vermont and, and really around the country. So our first speaker this evening is Susan Sussman. Susan is a caseworker for Senator Patrick Leahy, specializing in immigration issues, and Susan has worked with the senator for the past 11 years. Prior to that, Susan had a long legal career in a variety of roles, working on human and civil rights in Vermont and as an equity and diversity trainer and mediator. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Joan, and thank you everybody for coming out on such an incredibly beautiful day and evening. Uh, we were wondering if, we, if anybody was gonna come tonight, and so thank you all for being here, but I think it really shows um, the chord that this issue and these issues strike for a lot of people and the interest um, for, for folks, so thanks for being here. So as a caseworker for Senator Leahy, I, um, work on uh, issues involving anything having to do with immigration, anything having to do with any of the subsets of the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of State, which means I haven't been having anything to do lately. It's been a very quiet time in the office. Um, but uh, it's been overwhelming. It's been completely overwhelming. And uh, so I, what I'm gonna do really is set the stage with an overview of the title of, uh, of this evening, Current Challenges for Refugees, Immigrants, and Migrant Workers in Vermont. And what this really means is I'm going to be sharing a lot of really bad news, very discouraging things, but it's important to know and it's important to have an idea of what's really happening um, and things change by the minute. I was saying that I had one set of information when I was starting my day and then it was a good thing I was listening to NPR on the way driving back from Burlington because there was new news and actually a change in something. So here we go. So I'm gonna take it in the order of, the, of our topic, refugees, then immigrants, and then migrant workers, and you're gonna hear a lot more from the rest of the panelists. So what has happened for refugees and is that uh, Trump reduced the number of refugees uh, that the United States would accept for fiscal year 2018 reduced it from the 110,000 that had been raised, uh, the, that cap had gone up to from 80,000 to 110,000 by President Obama, and Trump reduced it to 45,000. That's for an annual uh, number. Um, and you just think of how many uh, refugees are, are flooding into European countries right now. And this is just minuscule. Um, but the, the uh, actual uh, arrivals and people being able to get through this refugee processing, it's looking like in FY18, we're not gonna be seeing 45,000 refugees in the United States, new refugees in, in the United States. There's an estimate of maybe about 21,000. Um, that not gonna even get near the cap of 45,000. So uh, Trump issued an executive order that froze all refugee resettlement for a while, and then uh, second, executive order came out, which um, reopened the program, but with two major things. One is additional extreme vetting, vetting for people. People now have to turn over their social media passwords and, for, and where they have been for the last 15 years. It used to be five years and extended to 15 years, so a lot more vetting of people. And it also prioritized categories of refugees for resettlement with refugees from the following countries at a lower priority and with even more extreme vetting. And those countries are Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Mali, North Korea, we'll see if that stays the same, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. And Vermont has resettled many refugees from uh, particularly Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, um, 
those three countries of that list of less prioritized countries. And what I'm seeing in the work that I do is just on an almost daily basis where uh, people have come and been resettled in Vermont as refugees, they have, they're allowed to file a particular type of petition to bring their family members here. It could be a parent, it could be a spouse, it could be children. And um, if they're coming from, if, the, if their family is from, you know, originally Somalia, South Sudan, or Sudan, it is ground to a halt. It's just happening so, so slowly. And people have been waiting for years for their family members to join them. So that's the impact I'm seeing right here in Vermont of these executive orders and the change in the refugee resettlement. For immigrants, that's the issue of the travel ban, or what we call travel ban number three, because there was travel ban number one that was uh, held up, uh, struck down by the courts and withdrawn by the uh, administration, then travel ban two, same thing, and then travel ban three. And this one uh, has gone up to the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court. We're waiting for a final decision. Uh, but while waiting for that decision, um, the Supreme Court allowed the travel ban to go into effect, even though lower court decisions had halted it. So this affects people who are coming to the United States as immigrants or non-immigrants. And non-immigrants could be visitors, um, you know, people trying to come to their child's graduation or somebody's wedding here in, in the United States. So either so non-immigrants are visitors, students, um, temporary workers, musical performers, you know, anybody who's coming on a temporary basis. And this has to do with um, prohibiting uh, the ability of people to come as an immigrant or a non-immigrant if you come from one of eight countries. Okay. And there are slight differences between the countries. I'm going to rattle those off, too. So it's Chad, Iran, uh, those students are, will be considered, Libya, Somalia, some non-immigrants might be allowed from Somalia, Yemen, North Korea, Syria, and uh, some governmental officials and their families from Venezuela. That's a particular category that went in there. Um, and then while not prohibited, uh, people from Iraq, uh, Iraqi nationals, will undergo special vetting. So some waivers are being granted, and some have already been granted. I worked on a case fairly recently where the a father trying to bring his 18-year-old daughter here as an immigrant has been going through the process for a couple of, you know, a couple of years, maybe. And, um, you know, the, the officer who interviewed her uh, was re recommending a waiver. So we thought, great, she's going to come. But oh no, it has to now go to the Department of State for further vetting. And the estimate is that uh, we won't know whether the waiver will be approved or not um, for another six months to a year. So even with the waiver process is taking quite a long time. And then migrant workers, though I, with Will Lambeck here, I don't know how much I want to say about this because you're going to talk a lot more about this. But I'll just set the stage here because basically the gloves have come off for, uh, you know, with, the, with other executive orders by Trump, which have empowered uh, Customs and Border Protection and ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, to go after anyone in the United States who is here without legal documentation. We are seeing, you know, increase in questioning, um, uh, buses uh, being boarded and people being questioned about their status, detentions, deportations, and raids nationwide. So that's, you know, that's some of the bad news. And then there's the, the emotional issue that is not necessarily covered by our topic tonight, but I want to mention it anyway, and that is the issue, that, an issue that is of tremendous concern to Senator Leahy, and I'm sure probably every single person in this room and on this panel, and that's this administration's zero tolerance policy, which is creating this uh, separation of families uh, and, and pulling children away from their parents and, and criminalizing, essentially criminalizing people who are crossing our southern border um, uh, and trying to seek asylum. There are many other parts of this, but I mean, that is the current issue of the day. Uh, the senator has 
made an impassioned speech on the floor of the Senate about this. He has co-sponsored, he is one of the 40 co-sponsors of Senator Feinstein's Keeping Families Together Act, which was introduced this week. And um, just yesterday, the Senate Judiciary Committee, of which the senator is a, is a member, um, spoke, uh, discussed this issue, and the senator made yet another impassioned uh, speech during the committee time, went way over his time doing that. And what he said three times very loudly is, where is our soul? So that's where my boss is on this. Um, and I do have some information on the table there about some of these things. But that is two minutes. All right. I usually talk forever, so this is really good. Um, so I, we'll all be able to answer questions, uh, or at least try to answer questions afterwards. But thanks again for coming. Thanks so much, Susan. Our next speaker this evening is Lori Stavrand. Lori has been the Community Partnership Coordinator for the United States Committee on Refugees and Immigrants in Vermont for nine years. Before that, Lori dedicated most of her professional life to practicing architecture domestically and internationally. She returned to Vermont in 1989 to raise her children near their grandparents. At USCRI, Lori is part of a team which assists refugees as they work to rebuild their lives and become contributing members of the community. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Thank you all for being here on this beautiful night uh, and thinking about others. Um, the, the US Committee for Refugees and Immigrants uh, is more than 100 years old and um, started at a time when um, there wasn't assistance for people coming from Europe. And people from Europe were not coming in suits and ties and you know, looking like we do today. These are our, our ancestors um, that we may have forgotten exactly what life was like for them. And they needed help when they were coming. And that is the tradition that we're following in today. Um, the refugee resettlement program, as we know it today, has evolved over time, but essentially started in 1980 when the Refugee Act was passed in response to the war in Vietnam. Uh, we have been resettling people from many countries around the world. Currently, we're resettling people from Bhutan, Burma, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. We should also be resettling people from Iraq, from Syria, from Somalia, from Sudan, from South Sudan, but they're not able to come. Um, and that really is not about numbers, it's about people. It's, it's about um, human rights. And that's something that we see really close, closely in our work every day. These are, are people who are relatives of the people we know. Um, some of them are relatives of people on staff. And they're people who are sometimes in danger. Um, not only is the US cutting back on refugees coming, they're also cutting back on the money that they're putting out for humanitarian uh, service in refugee camps. So people are seeing they have less food. There's less medical care. And that's what we're hearing from families who have families back in the camp. Uh, the people who come to Vermont, generally speaking, have uh, it's been 20 years since they fled their home. So we're not talking about some uh, recent problem. We're talking about a long-term um, tragedy, personal tragedy. Uh, and what happens when you're a refugee, it means that you've either been persecuted or you have reason to believe you will be persecuted or you've suffered through conflict. And you, you have no home and you also have no country. You have to have left your country. You have to argue and prove that you deserve refugee status. And you're out there. It's not like 
It's not like there was a flood and then you move to another house or maybe you rebuild your house. You have nowhere to go. You have no control over your life. And you are really at the mercy of um, the country where you are, any kind of services that you can receive from organizations such as the United Nations. Um, and from the, and the country where you are controls what kind of services are available to you. So if you follow anything that's happening, say, in Burma for the Rohingya, um, who, um, you know, they, they may be in Bangladesh and, and getting some minimal help. Um, they may still be internally displaced within their country, but they're really at risk. So the people here, they, they, that's where they were. And they, they are thinking about their family, their friends, and the people that they don't know that are still not safe. Um, when you come to the US as a refugee, you apply and you're 18, you have to be 18, you can have a spouse, and you can have children under 18. So if each of us think about our own families, you're a refugee, you know, who could be in your case? If, if you're thinking about a, a son, a daughter, a sister, a brother, a parent, who is not within that definition, they are another case. And they will be processed in a different, in a different case. So they may or may not be able to come through and travel to the US at the same time. Oftentimes, uh, it takes many years for all of the members of a family to be reunited in the US. Um, so this is, um, this makes it really hard for people even to make the initial decision to apply to be resettled. You can imagine if you're leaving behind your 18-year-old child to come here, and then if the travel ban happened. I mean, how, how, how inhumane is that? Uh, what we see happening, too, is that families are, when they flee, they may not all have been able to be together. Some family members may have been lost or ended up in totally different places. So when Susan is talking about helping people come here, um, these are close family members you know, that are really important um, to the fabric of a family. And, um, and then you have the situation of, say, the Syrian families in Rutland. We had three families come. Believe me, they wanted other members of their family to join them. So now they're here. It's not like the members of their family can get a visa and then go somewhere and they could meet in a third country. That's not going to happen. They are truly isolated from their family and, and not able to connect and worried about how people are, are doing. Um, the on again, off again uh, arrival of uh, refugees to the US makes it really hard for programs to function. It's very hard for staffing. It's hard for funding. We're talking about highly trained, experienced uh, staff who help people in basically a wraparound way to get started in the US. You don't want to dismantle that kind of resource. So if this goes on for an extended length of time, what you're doing is really having a long-term impact once you, you're able to, to restart uh, the uh, resettlement program in the US. Um, what we have been doing in Vermont is um, expanding our services to the people who are here, so we're broadening and deepening what we're doing. Um, we are offering more services to people who have different immigration status. Uh, for instance, uh, citizenship classes. You can imagine how important it is now 
to become a citizen. Uh, we've extended into more youth programs. So we are looking to do as much as we can for people who are here, help as many people to come, to, to join, and uh, we appreciate the support that you are showing by coming here, and we hope that you will be educating yourselves and educating others out in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Our next speaker is Tun Sein. Tun Sein was born in Burma and lived in a refugee camp on the border of Thailand and Burma. He came to the United States as an exchange student in 2003. Before coming here, he interned at the office of the Human Rights Documentary Unit for Burma. And this was followed two years later with volunteer work for a Catholic charity for the refugee resettlement program in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Tun Sein joined the Ref Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program in Colchester in 2008, first as a staff interpreter for Burmese refugees, and he now serves as a case manager. Welcome, Tun Sein. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I believe this is working. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for giving me opportunity to, to speak a little bit. Um, today, I just want to share a little bit about uh, that day-to-day um, -day that, uh, that I'm uh, working with uh, families in uh, Colchester, Vermont. So since this uh, new administration, the new president's come in, we have been so busy with the work that, the extra job, you know, extra work. A lot of people are coming in with so many questions and their fear, you know, they're going to happen to something, to things. So one of them is uh, a lot of families come here, some of them are elders, you know, or disabled, which some, some of them, they don't even speak, uh, and they don't even read and write in their own languages. But when they come here, uh, after, under this president, you have to become a citizen. In order to become a citizen, you have to study so hard, um, English, you know, and then the history, everything. So a lot of elders, they thought they would never take this test. They would just live on in the, under the green card, a permanent resident card, and then one of those days they would become a citizen. But now they're so being so fear, and they're becoming in every day and like tr trying to register other uh, English classes to become a citizen. But they are all and they are, you know they never learn English or their own languages, so it's so difficult, so difficult. But they have been working so so hard to become uh, a citizen. So that's uh, happening almost every day uh, at, at my work. And another thing is uh, also, there are also another group, the younger generation or younger, like uh, the, our age, they have managed to find their own time, their time after working, you know, two jobs or one job, and then they find their own time to study and become, you know, a permanent resident, uh, become a citizen. They have taken the test and they have passed and they have become citizens. And then holding this, um, you know, like uh, U.S. citizenship certificates and passports, and so proud of, you know, uh, we finally find a home, or we finally a place that we can call, you know, a, a country we, which we never had. So, but on the other hand, a lot of them are coming into me or people at our office asking question: Are we really allowed to travel, even with U.S. passports? Even we are American citizens, are we allowed to travel? And then they were coming and ask me a um, uh, question like, Tonsen, can you guarantee or can you ask your boss to write me a letter that I will travel, I will go, to go back to my home and visit, can you guarantee that? I'm like, oh, you are afraid, I know, but there's, there's no way I can guarantee, you know, I don't know for sure what's going to happen when they travel. I know I can say that with the U.S. passport, uh, US, U.S. citizen, you are legally allowed to travel, but we don't know, we cannot guarantee. So those things are happening every day uh, at our office. You know, I'm working with families all the time with those things. And another thing um, that I would like to share a little bit about is uh, about five years ago, we have uh, quite a few families that have uh, been coming here uh, eligible to file the family reunifications, which means like, uh, children who have been here, they can file, file uh, to apply for their parents to bring here or the parents already here can apply for their children to join here. That was like five, six years ago we applied. 
And then under this uh, president, you know, all these travel bans and all these new roads and things like that, this has slowed really down or it's not happening. No one's traveling. So people has been waiting for many years. The children are here, the parents are over there. You know, they're knocking on the door, door and asking me, like, can you do something? Can you call someone? I'm like, who do I call to? You know, who do I call to? We'll be calling to Susan's a lot for sure. You know? <laughs> so, but that's all we can do. And then can you write something? Can you talk to your boss? I said, I'll be talking to my boss every day about these things, but that's nothing we can do about it. But you know, like two years, three years can be like, if president, you know, four years, you can vote it out, you know, and it change. But like three years, four years, a lot of families waiting. This is life. This is our, a lot of life, you know, here is changing. Over there also, if they've been here for two, three years earlier, instead of waiting in the refugee camp, a lot of things can happen to them. A lot of things can happen to the children. A lot of things can happen to the parents. They have been already working here. They have been already established their life, living peacefully. The children will be in the school system or studying something great. Those things are like happening every day. So, you know, like like border and walls. Um, I I was born in the jungle where you know like the soldiers are fighting and killing. I have lit like you no know, close you know like borders i cannot cross to somewhere else or i have crossed into the another country as a refugee i lived in the walls for many years and as a refugee but i managed to get out of those refugee or those or those camps or those walls i came to united states about 10 15 years ago and i thought you no know, border walls those will be in my past i will never ever be talking again again but today, I'm here talking about this thing. You know, in the 21st century, we're still talking about this thing. I cannot believe myself that's still happening. So, yeah, that's all I want to share. Yeah. Thank you, Tenstein. Our next guest speaker is El Tayeb Awadala. El Tayeb grew up in the Darfur region of Sudan on his family's farm. He completed high school and started college in Khartoum, but the civil war in Sudan and Libya resulted in him becoming a refugee, and he resettled in Burlington. He is now in his first year at Norwich University. Welcome, El Tayeb. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much for everybody. And I'm happy to, you know, to meet you guys, all of you. And um, first of all, this is very hard to say. And if, if you have a lot of stories in your mind and you try to you know, start with something, it's going to be uh, difficult. Uh, I I'm grew up in Sudan. Uh, you guys, people who know, doesn't know Sudan. Sudan is in Africa, which is uh, South Egypt. Egypt is familiar with you guys. So, and I grew up in village. I used to go to school, but in the village is not like, you know, living in the cities. Uh, you you'll be having you know very limited e education and stuff you know material. After I finished uh, my primary school, I went to Khartoum to study high school. All this um, I'm depending of myself. It's not it's not like America here. You guys have family support. Also, you have uh, government support. You have to support. But back there, we don't have something like that. If, you if your family uh, able to support you, that's enough. If not, you're going to you know, find out yourself, and you're going to work hard to support yourself to pay your you know, uh, expenses for school, either for uh, living. I worked hard to finish, you know, high school and graduated to, to um, university. And then I went for university for four years, which is, was uh, electrical engineering. 
I I couldn't finish because of war in West Sudan. West Sudan is called Darfur. It consists from uh, three states, which you call here uh, in Vermont, like uh, you have Vermont, New Hampshire, and Boston, which is, you know, close. Um, after uh, fight happened in, in Darfur or war happened in Darfur because of the government, uh, government of Sudan is not something that, you know, um, is not good government. It's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible, very horrible. So they, 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 they don't, you know, they don't, they don't care about people. They don't care about, you know, I, I mean by people, you know, normal people. They don't care about elderly people. They don't care about kids. They don't care about students. They don't care even about the country. They are horrible. So because of that war, families and people, all the people, almost 80% of the people living in, in Darfur, which is in South Sudan, they moved to refugee camp in age, uh, in uh, in uh, there is two two main countries first of all the biggest one in chad which is we have a border between sudan and chad they are almost uh, can say i can say uh 12 refugee camps every refugee camp over 15000 people this only child in in uh, the other country in uh, Central Africa. Central Africa. This is consisting just two camps. I don't know exact what number. So my my family, all the people from West, they moved to a refugee camp, and I couldn't finish the school at that time. I started school in 2003 and I ended up in 2008, which is, you know, beginning of 2008. I moved to refugee camp because of family, so I couldn't, I couldn't finish, so a lot of pressure. So went to refugee camp to find my family, to live with them and help them Refugee camp, as you know, guys, uh, my friend he mentioned that is is not is place that just temporary is not living is not home. So I went to Libya to find a job. At the same times, I I have done a lot of work like driving, selling newspaper. So even I know a little bit of English is not that. Is not is not fluently, but I know a little bit of English. So I used to uh, drive, you know, between Chad and Libya. Chad and Libya also, you know, just a border. Is I uh, I find I I found I, I found a job there, and I went to Libya to work. That was 2011. No, it's 2010 by December of 2010. I find out myself, I, I got a job there, it's a pretty good job, but I, I couldn't work even, you know, three months because also Libya happened, you know, a uh, fight in Gaddafi, if you guys remember, in 2011. So in 2011, I find out myself because of horrible things happened in, in, in Libya, I simply i um i find out myself i cannot go back either my country sudan or refugee camp in chad i uh because of that thing uh because of that fight in 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 libya i i have a lot of friends co uh, co-workers and case managers, and uh, that was in, I try to remember this name, is, uh, 
what do you call the case manager was his saying and the other co co co-workers was um where uh this guy i forgot his name actually sorry so they are there are many different country they about seven countries one of those from uh Holland and Germany the other two from uh Africa and the other two we we are all about 11 people we found out ourselves we can now move somewhere in Libya if you go out or somewhere you're going to be killed by what they call um uh they they call revolution but right now we they they, they are doing um it's not a revolution actually so we find out ourselves inside the inside the house because our, our case manager he has a big house and he locked us we are 11 people because the we are we are working for the, for that company the case manager he locked us uh, in 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 big house so we spent about 47 days inside we cannot go outside within those 45 day, 47 days one of those revolution um uh we can, i can say just a malicious they came uh before before the before he locked the door they came in the middle of I, I i don't remember it's 11 days something like that they came over uh they killed one of the friends we 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 living with you know inside the house and they just simply killed over two days we we cannot do anything we don't have cell phones we, we we well the good thing we have a food inside and our case manager he came over over uh i think it's been three four days after after my our friend killed he came over and he locked the door from outside Re that's the reason he locked the door from outside is because if someone came you know he see this door is locked you think if there's nobody there so yeah after that uh red international uh cross the uh our case many he called red international cross and they came and you know pull us out from that situation it that it was difficult i cannot i don't know it's hard to believe it. So from there, okay, from there, I, uh, me and our friends, you know, simply UNSCCR, they move us to Benghazi. Benghazi is uh, in, 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 in central, in, in east of Libya. And then from there, I went to another refugee camp in Egypt. From Egypt, I spent two years similar thing so from egypt i went to romania help with uh, the guy you know the the organization organization they helping us is simply uncr they move us from uh from egypt to uh to romania so from romania i spent six months and then i came here to vermont So that thing is a lot of things happen, but I couldn't mention a lot. And last year, I just try to remember this, uh, Miss uh, Susan. Uh, last year, last June, my mom, my mom was sick, so I I tried to take care of her because of she need someone to take care of her. And I'm gonna need something to travel, and I apply for travel document, and it's kind of you cannot getting fast. You're gonna need six, seven months in order to get that. So she helped me for that, and uh, I'm gonna say thank you, thank you so much. 
you saved my uh, my mom life. Thank you for that. So I I went to India and I take care from my mom and she's now she's good. So also now I'm gonna just take a minute and um, gonna thank you uh, all of you guys, Lori, Susan, and Legit family living there. So thank you, everybody. You know those people they just supported me. So again, I just say th thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. With our next speaker, we shift our focus a bit to uh, thinking about the migrant worker community here in Vermont. Will Lembeck is a staff member of Migrant Justice and a proud graduate of Montpelier High School. Migrant Justice's mission is to build the voice, capacity, and power of the farm worker community and engage community partners to organize for economic justice and human rights. Welcome, Will. Thank you, Joan. Um, thank you, Central Vermont Refugee Action Network, for putting on this panel, panel and to all the previous speakers. Um, how are folks feeling? Ready for another two? <laughs> we can do it. All right, if you need to get up to have a cookie or use the bathroom and stretch your legs, I won't be offended. Don't worry about it. Um, so as Joan said, uh, I, I grew up in, in Montpelier, uh, just down the road. Um, uh, uh, worked at the, the Ben & Jerry Scoop Shop in City Center. For those of you who follow migrant justice work, you might appreciate the irony of that. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, growing up here, my, uh, my idea of uh, Vermont uh, uh, and, and the people in it sort of looked similar to, to what this room looks like tonight. I, I understood it to be a, a, a majority, a predominantly uh, white space, uh, and, and immigrant sort of meant flatlander. It meant you came from New Jersey or Massachusetts. Um, and it wasn't until I uh, found out about the work of migrant justice that I realized that um, uh, down the road from where I grew up, working in the dairy farms were immigrant workers, and that our state's uh, most important and mo certainly most iconic industry uh, was almost wholly reliant uh, on the labor of immigrant workers, primarily from Mexico and Central America. Um, we, we estimate that about 90% uh, of people who are hired working in dairy barns in Vermont today uh, are immigrant workers. Uh, and the reasons for that are, are complex, and, and the community is fairly new. The, this uh, changeover in the industry has happened uh, within the past 20 or 30 years. And um, actually, is, is Joseph Gaines in the room? Okay, well, I figured he might be. This is his, his sort of event. But um, uh, he just shared a, a tremendous article, uh, the, the name of the author I'm forgetting. But uh, uh, the, there's a, a lot of people talk about a push-pull factor when they talk about immigration. Um, the, and, and in the case of uh, Mexican workers in the dairy industry, the push and pull factors are really similar. I mean, the reasons why people are emigrating from Mexico and Central America have everything to do with the United States. Uh, our history and, and ongoing reality of imperial foreign policy, particularly as it's enacted through trade policies that uh, displace folks, force them off their lands, uh, prevent their ability to make a living, uh, and in essence uh, force them as economic refugees to come to the United States. And it just so happens that those same neoliberal trade policies and processes of corporate uh, consolidation and globalization uh, are giving Vermont family farms a real raw deal. Uh, many uh, small producers have gone under in the past decades. Uh, there were something like 10,000 dairy farms uh, across Vermont in 1950. There's around 750 today. And in order to survive, farms are having to buy up their neighbors' herds and lands and grow and who are they going to hire to work these larger farms? Immigrant workers, the cheapest labor they can find. Um, and uh, the majority, the vast majority of those workers, uh, although certainly not all, and we never make an assumption when talking about any particular worker, any particular farm, but the vast majority of those workers are undocumented because uh, for 
uh, a person from Mexico or Central America coming to the U.S. to work in agriculture and particularly dairy, uh, there's really no uh, there's no path to citizenship. There's no path to get a visa uh, to come and do that work. Uh, the the opportunities for doing it, as the right wing would call the the right way, or to get in line, uh, are nil. Uh, and so structurally, the uh, industry relies on undocumented labor. Um, and the conditions, uh, uh, people often talk about feeling like prisoners on your farm. Imagine for a minute uh, uh, being brought to Vermont, being dropped off on a farm in the middle of the night. Uh, you're shown your housing. You're shown where the dairy barn is. Um, you don't know uh, where, where you are. You don't know uh, oftentimes even the name of the farm. Uh, uh, but what you do know is that uh, if you step foot off the farm uh, to go into town, to go uh, hang out in a park, to go see a movie, um, that uh, you're putting yourself at risk of being arrested. So people talk about the, uh, the state of feeling like a prisoner on the farm. Um, and migrant justice grew out of that community and grew out of those conditions. In 2009, a young dairy worker named Jose Obeth was killed while working on a farm in uh, Franklin County, Vermont, uh, in a very gruesome and very much preventable workplace accident. And his death was really a spark and a wake-up call for the community to start coming together uh, and talk about what can be done uh, uh, about our situation in this state. Uh, and the organization formed through a series of regional assemblies, people meeting together to talk about those collective uh, problems and start to envision collective solutions. Uh, and as an organization, Migrant Justice has been founded around a human rights framework, talking about what are the human rights of farm workers, what are the human rights of immigrants uh, living in Vermont, uh, and how can this organization be a vehicle to take collective action to win and advance those human rights. And so we've done that through a number of campaigns uh, in 2013, uh, winning access to driver's licenses for all immigrants, regardless of documentation status, uh, which had a tremendous uh, impact on people's lives in this state. Uh, in 2014 and beyond, beginning to organize uh, and win progressively stronger uh, what are called fair and impartial policing policies, although in, in many places they might be known as sanctuary policies uh, across the state of Vermont, uh, work which continues and that I'll come back to. Uh, and then most recently um, winning the, the first of what we hope will be many milk with dignity agreements. The idea being that uh, corporations dairy brands are ultimately responsible for the conditions in their supply chain. And when they're selling you a product that's built on the abuse and exploitation of workers, they need to take responsibility for rectifying those abuses. Uh, and last October, Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream became the first company uh, to formally recognize that by signing an agreement, um, uh, joining the Milk with Dignity program. And the implementation of that program is underway, meaning that uh, Ben & Jerry's pays a premium, a higher price, uh, and in return, its suppliers commit to upholding a worker-authored code of conduct um, that they're going to respect the human rights and dignity of the workers on those farms. And that's leading to a whole host of improvements in wages, scheduling, housing, health and safety, uh, among, other, uh, among other conditions. Um, but of course, uh, uh, we're here tonight to talk about uh, immigration enforcement. Um, uh, and one thing I want to mention, and, uh, and I know Duff will uh, touch on this as well, uh, and what's often being lost, I think, in the, the coverage of the atrocities of the Trump administration is that the continuities of immigration enforcement from administration to administration and from year to year are much greater than the differences. Uh, and by that, I mean that the, the lived reality of immigrants in Vermont uh, uh, has changed under the Trump administration much less than many people uh, might believe. Um, that the, the reality of uh, being at risk uh, of detention and deportation for driving to the grocery store, uh, uh, as an example, uh, has always been there for workers. They've always suffered from criminalization, uh, from xenophobia and nativism, from racial profiling. Um, and in essence, uh, what the Trump administration has done 
is that they've taken the machinery of mass deportation built by the Obama administration and are running it at full speed. Um, the Obama administration deported more immigrants uh, in, in the eight years that he was in office than any previous presidential administration has done. Uh, and although the, the numbers of immigrants being deported and detained under the Trump administration is staggering, uh, it doesn't rise to the levels that we saw in, in 2013 in, in most categories. Um, so in Vermont, uh, what does immigration enforcement look like? It looks like uh, undercover agents of immigration customs enforcement hunting down dairy workers across the state, arresting people in parks, uh, at, in grocery stores, outside of banks, uh, on the curb as they're taking the trash out. Uh, and it means officers from uh, CBP, Customs and Border Protection, uh, rampantly profiling workers uh, anywhere within the vicinity of the northern border, uh, pulling people over for driving while brown, uh, detaining them, and putting them in deportation proceedings. Uh, what we're seeing is about uh, one person a week is being arrested in the state of Vermont by either ICE or Border Patrol. Um, and in particular, one example uh, uh, that we've seen is uh, ICE's retaliation against workers uh, who protest these uh, horrendous actions. Uh, in Vermont, we've seen a number of community leaders and human rights defenders particularly targeted by ICE because of their activism, because they're exercising their First Amendment right to speak up and defend their rights and defend their dignity as immigrant workers in this state. Um, so uh, what can be done? Uh, uh, Migrant Justice asks that um, people who are horrified by what's happening, who feel that this is a moral stain on our country, who want to say not in my name, uh, that you seek out and support the organizing being led by immigrants, being led by directly affected communities. Um, and because I'm in Montpelier, one example of that that I'll mention uh, is uh, in the fair and impartial policing policy. Uh, so Montpelier right now has an opportunity to strengthen its fair and impartial policing policy, a policy that should draw a bright red line between the role of the Montpelier Police Department and immigration enforcement. Uh, yet currently, it's much more of a, 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 a porous fence, let's say. Um, and uh, uh, Migrant Justice has been in conversation uh, with uh, various people in the uh, current administration. Can we say that in Montpelier? With Anne, <laughs> it's not, not really an administration. Um, and, uh, and I think folks are really receptive to change, um, but uh, it would help a lot for, uh, for uh, people who live in Montpelier to, to uh, get Anne on the phone, talk to your counselors as well and say, uh, this is an issue uh, that, that we care about. Uh, Montpelier in no way should be uh, doing the work of deportation, and we want to make sure that, that our city and our resources is not complicit in this human rights tragedy that's happening today. Um, and then uh, also I want to announce uh, uh, June 25th uh, at the State House, a coalition of groups is organizing uh, a rally June 25th, it's a Monday night, 6 p.m. at the State House Lawn, uh, specifically focused on ending family separation. Um, and it's called the first day of no school rally, uh, sort of to commemorate. It's the, the day after school's out. Many families in Vermont are going to be spending more time together. Uh, and in doing so, we should remember those families who are being torn apart. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Our final speaker on our panel this evening is James Duff Lyle. James has been the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Vermont since 2016. Prior to that, he was a staff attorney for the ACLU of Arizona, where he investigated and litigated civil rights issues related to the US-Mexico border. James also has experience representing detained and unaccompanied immigrant children in the Los Angeles area in deportation proceedings. Welcome, James. Thanks, John. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, and thanks to the organizers and to the panelists. It's really a great honor to be, to be here and to hear um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of powerful uh, experience uh, among this group. Uh, so I, I'm the last to go. I'll try and keep it uh, brief so that we can get to your 
uh, questions and, and have a, a discussion. Um, I could talk all night about immigrants' rights and, and these issues, but I will try not to do that so that we can, so we can um, have some questions. But um, I mean, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the work that the ACLU is doing and um, a little bit, uh, you know, as Will indicated, I, this is not the first time I've uh, followed Will and, and essentially wanted to just agree with everything he said, just yeah, what he said, and, and that's it. Um, but you know, to say a little bit about the continuity um, between uh, this administration's policies and past policies, because I think that is really important to recognize and understand if we're ever going to change it. Um, and so to do that, uh, you know, in the course of talking a little bit about the ACLU's work, I also want to talk about my experience, um, uh, not as an immigrant or um, working with um, immigrant workers, but um, representing and, and uh, fighting for the civil rights of immigrants and trying to counter the abuses and excesses of uh, immigration officials uh, that, that, that they encounter. So um, my, my first job out of law school um, was at an organization called Esperanza Immigrant Rights Project in Los Angeles. Um, there, uh, most of my work involved representing indigent, unaccompanied children who had come to this country on their own and been pl apprehended and placed in deportation proceedings without the right to an attorney. Um, so a lot of people don't even realize that immigrants do not have the right to inter an attorney when, when they're in deportation uh, proceedings. Criminal defendants, generally, especially under with serious charges, we everybody has the right to an attorney provided by the government if you can't afford it. That is not true of immigrants. That includes immigrant immigrant children of any age, infants, toddlers, uh, teenagers. Uh, and so my work was to, and that is still the case, um, the ACLU actually has been litigating uh, a case to try and win uh, the constitutional right to representation uh, for immigrant children. Um, we had a big setback in February where a three-judge panel in the Ninth Circuit in California essentially ruled that children do not have a constitutional right to be represented by a lawyer when they're facing deportation proceedings and are facing off against a skilled and adult uh, ICE attorney. Um, so that is the state of the law now. Um, and so that's why I was in Los Angeles to represent at least some of those children, as many of those children I could, and there are organizations around the country that do that, also good organizations to support. Um, and so, you know, um, most of my children were teenagers who had fled horrific violence and abuse in Central America and Mexico. Many of them had traveled on top of freight trains through Mexico. Uh, many of them were abused, um, beaten, and neglected along the way, somehow made it to the United States where they were apprehended and often faced additional abuse at the hands of the U.S. Border Patrol along the border. Um, placed into custody and, and placed in removal proceedings, and then you know my, my work was to represent them. Um, and so a lot of those kids, all the children that I represented, um, now have green cards. Um, they are uh, by now they've they've graduated, they've uh, been married, they've started families, they own businesses, um, and but. You know, the fact is that they had to go through a lot, and there are still many, many children and many people who don't have the legal representation that they need to, to, uh, uh, to, to win their cases. And I mean, the statistics show if you don't have an attorney uh, and you're facing deportation, your chances of winning are much, much, much lower than if you are represented by counsel, which isn't shouldn't be um, surprising. Um, so, after a few years of that, I. Um, Having heard about the experiences of these kids along the border, I, I went to the border. I took a summer to volunteer with an organization called No More Deaths, which is a humanitarian aid uh, organization that operates in southern Arizona, uh, in um, south of Tucson. Uh, and, and No More Deaths and a couple of other similar groups uh, for years have been leaving food and water and medical supplies along desert trails uh, where migrants cross into the United States and where hundreds of people that we know of and probably many more that we never know about die every year trying to cross the border. Um, and they do this in large part because the existing border infrastructure, for all the talk of building more walls, the fact is there are already a lot of walls along our border and a lot of border militarization. Um, designed to drive people into the deadliest and most remote sections of our border where they are more likely to die 
and where hundreds of them do die every year. Um, that is an intentional US border policy that, again, goes back decades. That is not new. The new border wall isn't going to be a departure from that. This is US policy designed uh, to deter people uh, um, with a threat of death from coming to this country, regardless of what violence they're fleeing, regardless of whether they're fleeing for their lives. The calculus is that the, that the fear of perishing in the desert will be so great that they will not enter the country. Um, and so doing that work, uh, I, um, uh, among other things, I encountered some U.S. Border Patrol agents, and I came to get to know the U.S., started to get to know the U.S. Border Patrol. I've since gotten to know them even better. Um, but I learned everything I needed to know uh, pretty early on. The U.S. Border Patrol, uh, you know, working for No More Deaths, I saw walking the trails and leaving water that a huge number of humanitarian aid supplies, almost half of the water bottles that we would leave out would be destroyed by Border Patrol agents, would be slashed, kicked, thrown into ditches, um, and, and confiscated. Um, and you know, this is life-saving humanitarian supplies that was being destroyed by the Border Patrol. Um, I also saw the Border Patrol has a long history of uh, harassing and even prosecuting humanitarian aid workers. Now, there are currently multiple No More Desk volunteers who are facing federal charges for harboring um, uh, undocumented immigrants um, when they were in the course of, of doing essentially humanitarian life-saving work. And so, you know, to see the Border Patrol not only enacting a policy that is designed to endanger people's lives, uh, but then doubling down and, you know, affirmatively acting to ensure that life-saving supplies do not reach them and that they are more likely to die, that told me all I needed to know about U.S. Border Patrol and U.S. Border Policy. Um, but that was not the end of my work. I, uh, after that summer, I, I uh, got a job with the ACLU of Arizona as a staff attorney. Um, and there, uh, I worked on Border Patrol issues uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, before that, actually, I, I was in Phoenix um, and was drawn to Arizona because at the time we, we were dealing, the ACLU and others were dealing with SB, litigating SB 1070, the Show Me Your Papers law, uh, the anti-immigrant law uh, in Arizona, and, and its chief proponent and practitioner, Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Um, who the ACLU sued out of business um, uh, over the court. I was not involved in that, but I, I saw my colleagues uh, very much were, um, as well as the entire community in Maricopa County was involved in, in resisting and eventually um, getting Sheriff Arpaio kicked out of office. He was then prosecuted, convicted uh, of, um, uh, uh, what was the charge? Contempt. Contempt, thank you. Um, of course, he, he was then pardoned by, by President Trump. Um, but, you know, there I saw the uh, really firsthand the, the devastating impacts of empowering or allowing local officials to act as immigration agents. And that is why the fair and impartial policing policy that Will uh, referenced earlier is so important. Um, because, uh, you know, in my experience, whenever local police or local law enforcement try to get in in involved in the immigration business, constitutional rights violations are a guarantee that they, they turns from, like, from night to day. Um, local cops are not um, empowered to and are not able to enforce immigration law in a constitutional manner, nor should they. Um, so I, I would uh, second and reiterate um, what Will said about the importance of getting a strong division between our, our local police here in Vermont and, and immigration officials. Um, I mean, my other work with the Border Patrol um, involved a number of lawsuits. The ACLU is uh, is currently, I, I'm not obviously on the border anymore, but the ACLU is currently uh, litigating the, uh, the policy of forced separation of families. Um, and we had a good decision recently um, with the a court, um, again in the Ninth Circuit, um, denying the government's motion to dismiss. We are hoping to get an injunction to stop this practice, but even if we do, um, it, it will be a limited injunction and will not end uh, a lot of these practices. Um, uh, and, but, you know, just because I'm, I'm short on time, I'll just say, you know, whether it's 
forcing people into the desert, whether it's prosecuting border crossers to the fullest extent of the law, um, whether it's abusing children in custody, um, which I also documented and saw a lot of in Arizona, or whether it's forced separation of families. All of this comes under the rationale of U.S. border policy is policy of deterrence. Again, that you make things so miserable uh, and you inflict so much pain and suffering and misery on people that no matter what they're fleeing, they're not going to come here. And that has been U.S. border policy for a long time, for decades. Um, and we're just seeing a, an even more extreme and inhumane and monstrous version of that right now. So. Thank you again to all of our speakers this evening. The knowledge and the experience that you all have shared is just so incredibly powerful. Um, I think from our speakers, we've gotten the broad scope of the political landscape and policies that impact immigrants and refugees now living in Vermont. We've heard personal stories of struggle that led to people arriving here and the continued struggle, especially now in trying to live just normal lives and be reunited with family and also stories of the human rights abuses faced by many immigrants and migrant workers living here in Vermont. So our forum this evening, Borders and Walls, is designed to help create a deeper understanding of who new Vermonters are, the obstacles they face, and what's being done to support them and keep them safe amongst us here in our community. Um, and now we have time for your questions from the audience. I'm going to check in with our organizers. Is there a microphone set up? There's a microphone yes, that will be there passed is. And I just around. Wanna, I want to show you guys. It's really important that you put the microphone in front of your mouth because if you're like this, you can't be heard. So just keep it like that, okay? Great. And I think Pam will come around. You can just raise your hand to indicate if you have a question. Does that, does that work? And um, I'll, I'll ask you to keep your um, questions brief. You can direct your question to a particular panelist if, if you um, have a question that's for someone in particular, or just raise a general question. And I'm sure amongst our group, um, they'll be able to address, address it. Don't be shy. OK, Kate, great. I'm going to cross in front of you, OK. Excuse me. This is so we can all hear. Thank you. Um, Will, I didn't, what is driving well brown? I believe you said that. Did you say that? I don't know what that is. Thanks for the question. Um, it's, a, it's a shorthand to refer to uh, racial profiling by either police or immigration enforcement. Uh, so oftentimes, um, when you read uh, arrest reports by Border Patrol about what was the suspicion that caused them to pull over a car, uh, they'll, they'll write things like, uh, a subject was driving in a way that led me to believe he was an illegal alien. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's one of a, a number of pretexts that, that uh, uh, Border Patrol will, will use that are so flimsy on the face that we, we know that the, the only alternative can be racial profiling. So the term is actually sort of uh, adopted from, from black organizers who, who have been talking about driving while black uh, as... Uh, the, the experience of racial profiling and uh, uh, so driving while brand comes from that. Okay, Jose. I guess I just wanted to make a quick comment. I just came back from Mexico City this week and had a lot of discussions about this, but uh, today I was on the phone because I used to volunteer and I also worked along the border where they're planning to build this tent city. Uh, it was just on the edge of the district that I, I worked with, the, the, the state rep of that area. Um, and I want you to know that uh, this is a horrific place, a very remote location. It is exactly uh, what was being mentioned earlier. It's a policy of the Border Patrol to squeeze from both coastlines to the most remote, most dangerous places. And uh, that is uh, the Big Bend region, which is a fairly remote area of Texas, which it would be they're trying to push people to go towards Sierra Blanca, which is a, you know, a, a, where there is a private facility run by um, uh, Emerald Corporation. They used to have a tent there, and I used to go visit. I spent a year going to these facilities and visiting people. And the conditions that, at least the adults that I saw um, that were being held there, were, 
were um, inhumane, and uh, and I, I, I think it's a, it's a a crime. I spoke to people today down there who were organizing in the town that I was in, and the attorneys I used to work with, and there's a, a team out of San Antonio, and there's some local attorneys that are trying to get organized, but they really don't know how to, you know, they, 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 they move in such a way that um, it's difficult to, to approach the problem, but um, yeah, there was, um, there's certainly people on the ground right there, and anything that you can do to, of course, uh, as you might know, our congressman is going down Sunday to Brownsville, but uh, anything that you can do to write um, uh, representatives, uh, senators, um, to put pressure, because uh, my friends down there feel that really it's going to take action, uh, uh, congressional action, to really make any change um, happen. Thank you. So I have two questions, which I hope is okay. One is, is there an estimate um, of undocumented immigrants that work and live in Vermont? And then two, is there a basis for where refugees get resettled in the US, like a process? Is it based on the states or the communities? Does anyone have a an estimate for the for the first question, the number of undocumented immigrants living and working in Vermont. Does Lady have best? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you know, and Will, what do you think in terms of migrant workers? About seven hundred. Uh, we had been saying twelve hundred, and then we heard it was more like seven hundred. We keep with the twelve to fifteen hundred okay. uh, uh, migrant workers, and and as I said, the the vast majority of whom are undocumented, um, but but certainly yeah. not all. And then you can add to that some unknown number. I mean, there's no way to, to know. Um, in terms of, um, and, and maybe Lori can help with this too, in terms of refugee resettlement, um, as, you know, as Eltai said it, and Tun said, it comes through UNHCR, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. So they're the ones who um, decide whether somebody can be classified as a refugee. And then there are agreements with countries all around the world. And in the United States, um, it's a decision that goes um, uh, with the administration in terms of how many uh, refugees will be accepted in the United States. And then there are, how many Volags? Seven, nine. nine. There, uh, there, there are not currently nine volunteer, I'm not gonna remember what Volag stands for, but there are nine nonprofit organizations, um, Catholic Charities, Methodist, um, USCRI, um, a number of other organizations, with uh, HIAC, HIAS, um, yeah. and, and so they, these nine organizations then are, um, uh, have to go through a process of figuring out what communities uh, can support refugees and they get, um, then they'll be assigned uh, a certain number um, on an annual basis. So each organization that um, has a contract with the State Department to resettle refugees has to apply every year um, to show that they are, ha have the capacity and determine what capacity they have. And then the uh, State Department, uh, PRM, Population Refugee Migration, that Bureau of the State Department, confirms whether they agree or not with um, the number that can be resettled. Uh, and that's a maximum number, that's not a minimum number of refugees that can come. How a refugee ends up in Vermont, um, if there is a family member, if there is a tie in Vermont, Ideally, they would be coming to Vermont, um, but oftentimes refugee families are split up even around the world, not just within the US. Um, so they might be coming to Vermont for that reason. If they have no ties anywhere, then uh, the State Department uh, meets with the nine Volags, um, and each site that resettles refugees has certain capacities to resettle people. And one of the most important um, consideration is, is there a community there 
of the person or the family, the case that's going to be resettled because um, one thing that our country is getting right is understanding people need a peer group. So instead of scattering people randomly around the country, uh, the idea is to have uh, a cultural community within the, the greater community so people have a peer group to support them and then they also have the support of the greater community. And so basically once a week, the nine organizations meet with the state department and it's almost like a sports draft. You know, they, they take their turns, you know, pass around the cases and say, you know, yes, we are resettling uh, Ethiopians and it looks like we could resettle this family, we'll take this case, and then you know they just go around till all the cases are accepted. And one thing that uh, Lori was just reminding me, that um, with the reduction in the number of refugees that are gonna be allowed to come to the United States, we've heard that the Department of State is going to not renew all nine VOLAG con contracts. They're gonna be forced to either consolidate or disappear, and um, USCRI and all the other VOLAGs, they get uh, funding per person who is resettled. So at the lesser number, and that's what Laurie was referring to before, people, uh, organizations are having to lay off staff, and basically what's happening is the dismantling of the refugee resettlement infrastructure. I mean, it's just going to, there are offices that are closing, um, and very, people are very fearful of what that long-term impact is going to be because people, hopefully, with the new cha with the change of administration, it'll ramp up again. But you know, you have to then rebuild. So. Until fairly recently, I was unaware that Vermont hosts about 400 ICE workers, and I'm curious if what it would take for us to reconsider that. <laughs> Lori said that question's for me, and I said, I know it's for me, but I'm pretending it's not. Um, I, it really has to do with the staffing that's going to be determined by the administration. You know, I mean, I guess Congress could say we're not going to fund X number of ICE workers. Um, I, that would be interesting uh, in this climate to see. Uh, so I, you know. I don't have a better answer to, for you than that. I also want to recognize one of my um, congressional delegation colleagues who's here, um, Sheila Reed from uh, Senator Sanders' office, who, do, who does work with um, farmers and agricultural. Um, anything else you'd like to add to that? So women, uh, children, housing, and disabilities is part of Sheila's portfolio, too. So I just want to welcome Sheila here as well. And actually, I don't do farming. Oh, that's here. Oh, yes, that's right. I knew that. <laughs> I had a question about what happens when someone gets a green card. Um, I know that it can be renewed, but, but there are two parts of the question. Can it be renewed over and over again, or is there a limit on the number of times it can be re renewed? Yeah. And if you, um, if you have a green card, are you still in danger of being deported? May I take that one? Um, so yes, you can renew your green card. You, actually, you, ha you have to renew your green card every 10 years. Um, but after having a green card for five years, you can apply to become a U.S. citizen. Or if you've gotten your green card through marriage to a U.S. citizen, you, can, you only have to wait three years before applying to become a U.S. citizen. Um, there's no limit to the number of times you can renew a green card, but you are always in danger of losing that green card. For example, if you commit a felony. Um, and there are other, uh, mainly that. Um, or if you found to have lied to the U.S. government or misrepresented anything in order to get your green card or to enter the United States, um, that can uh, jeopardize your, your status as a lawful permanent resident. So that's why, and I think that's why Tun is seeing so many people applying to become citizens because they want to have that, because you, you cannot have your citizenship taken away from you, again, unless you have lied to the U.S. government in uh, getting that uh, citizenship. So um, that's the, you know, that's the situation for, for green cards. 
So we've got a question back here, and there are lots of questions, which is great. Um, I've been reading a lot of reports about um, buses, Amtrak trains being boarded by um, folks asking for documentation. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I read said, they can't do that if it's not within 100 miles of a border. Well, we're in Vermont. It's all within 100. I don't know. Maybe there's like a little bit of southern Vermont that isn't. So I was curious what the actual border, if, if what that 100 mile you know, buffer zone means in terms of um, you know, the ability to be asked for documentation. And then I guess if somebody has any thoughts about what people could do who were legally here, if that, that was a situation to, to try and, and, I don't know, short circuit that or like be helpful. Um, you know, and also I don't carry around my documentation of my citizenship, so <laughs> I technically would, you know, be in trouble if that's really a hundred miles to the, so um, just trying to figure out what we can do and what they're allowed to do. It's a great question. So um, it, it depends on the context that we're talking about. Um, and I, I, there is, I have, I brought some know your rights information about what are your rights with border patrol in the border region. Um, so I'd encourage people who are curious about this to, to take a look at that. Um, but I mean, Border Patrol has increased enforcement powers within a reasonable distance of the border, which has been defined as 100 miles. I, I think uh, that's not a reasonable distance. And some, uh, 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 Senator Leahy and others have uh, repeatedly proposed shortening that distance significantly to 25 miles, I believe. Um, and we would certainly support that. Um, this, this goes back decades to like the 1950s. Regulations set reasonable distance at 100 miles. At that point, there were like 2,000 Border Patrol agents. There are now 20,000 Border Patrol agents. Um, and they, um, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, depending whether they are setting up a checkpoint or whether they are pulling over, pulling you over in your in your vehicle, whether they're entering onto your land, whether they're trying to board a Greyhound bus or an Amtrak train. I mean, the rules can vary depending on the context. But a, a few things to keep in mind is they do not have a right to search you um, without probable cause, although they often deny that or pretend that that's not the case. Um, the Fourth Amendment, you know, protection against unreasonable search um, applies in the interior of the country still, even with the Border Patrol, something that they are either unaware of or, or, or pretend to be unaware of. Um, they need, if you know, they need reasonable suspicion to make a vehicle stop. Um, they cannot stop people on the basis of race. I mean, they do all of these things, um, but that's why it is, it is really important to know what your rights are and um, to safely uh, assert them. Um, as to Greyhound buses, uh, I mean, the ACLU sent a letter to Greyhound a few months ago. We also locally sent a follow-up letter to some of the local bus line, Peter Pan and I think Concord Coach Lines, um, essentially saying, as a private business, you don't have to allow uh, the Border Patrol to, to board your buses. Um, I mean, they're, they're allowing this to happen, but I mean, DHS even has its own regulation saying that private businesses don't have to um, go along with this. Um, and so far, Greyhound has not, um, not wanted to uh, engage with that. Um, they, they essentially buy Border Patrol's argument that, um, you know, the regulations say that we can. The Border Patrol, again, ignores that the regulations have long since been interpreted by the US Supreme Court as limiting their authority. Um, I mean, the Fourth Amendment controls here. And um, a lot of times we see Border Patrol sort of misleading people or overstating the degree of authority they have, and they, and they all too often uh, get away with it. Um, so again, I think it is really important that people know, know their rights, and, and we do have some materials to, uh, to help with that. I'd like to add one thing to that. Sometimes ICE shows up because someone in the community calls them. Mm -hmm. And you could be painting while black. <laughs> I mean, you could be existing, breathing, and not be white and have a concerned neighbor call and report you. And you better have your papers with you. So what's that? also to sh share one thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, at the bus station, uh, arresting or, you know, border patrol checking on you, it's 
it might be doing they might be doing more now than before but it's it's not new mm -hmm. i have to share my experience my own experience it was in uh i don't know the 2006 long time ago i was uh traveling to medbury i was visiting to a friend of mine and then coming back and i was in burlington at the greyhound bus station and i was buying a ticket and after that i bought a ticket and sat down and then uh, about like five minutes later, a police walk in, and then he walked straight to me. No one else, no one asked any questions. And then he asked me for my identifications. So at that time, you know, I was just traveling here and there, so I did not bring my IDs with me. I left in uh, Barry. I was living with a host family then. And then they said, I don't have uh, any ID. I don't so they took me to all the way to the border, to uh, uh, the sale of Highgate. And then they kept me there for like five hours. Mm -hmm. And then finally they found all the paper. I explained everything, you know, I came here legally, I have all the paper you can look at in your system and everything. So they said, we check, we don't have it. But when I got there for after five hours, they let me go. So that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add one more story to that. Um, uh, Border Patrol uh, used to uh, do an occasional um, stop down at White River Junction on I-91. And um, 91? Yeah. Um, and one time, uh, a tall, balding um, uh, white gentleman and his wife were driving up from Washington, D.C., and um, that he got pulled, they got pulled over by uh, border, uh, by CVP there, and he was asked to get out of the car. And um, when uh, the driver said, under what authority are you asking me to get out of the car? This young agent pointed to his firearm and said, with this, uh, under this authority, at which time Senator Leahy did get out of the car um, and, uh, and asked to speak to a supervisor. And you know, those, those, uh, that stops, stopped shortly after that. Um, but it's something that, you know, and you can only, he wasn't detained for five hours, like, yeah. Um, but it, w it had a lasting impact, and one of the reasons that uh, I think he's so vociferous in trying to get that 100-mile border mm. um, limit changed. That also, again, I'm not making this up. That also, and that's that same place, you know, the 91. I was, again, pulled over. <laughs> when my host family, you know, like my first year, I'm here, and then they, they were like, they want me to take to New York City. I was so excited. We all... Uh, we all were in the car, you know, we drove up there. The police, you know, they pulled over, and because of me, you know, they pulled over there. And then my host family was there. Don't say, we, in our life, we'll never get pulled over until we host you. <laughs> 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 I'm like, yeah, welcome to the world. You know, welcome to my world. You know? yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's happened to me. The yeah. question so everybody in the back, Pam? Uh, right now we have uh, five people waiting to ask okay. questions, okay? Great. And they're sort of in the back, and but I'll come around to the front in just a minute. So we need to keep our questions brief, okay? So everybody gets a chance. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, my question's aligned to the comment from the participant from the audience about how people are scrambling right now about the parental separation issue that's going on at the border. I work in healthcare, and I know of no major organization, academic, public health that aren't writing letters, you know, sending in statements, posting things on their websites, organizing students and residents. We're doing all of those things, but, but no one's really clear that that's going to do much. I don't know of a central piece of legislation that's being considered or whether there's a champion. I know as of this morning, you know, people were trying to pull together clusters, but, but is there a piece that, that would be worth really focusing on? Um, I was saying earlier there is a there is a standalone uh, piece of legislation called keeping uh, keeping family keeping families together. I, I'm sorry, I have it right here. Uh, yes, it's a standalone, and it has you know 40 at least at last count it for me it was uh, I saw 40 senators who had signed on, um, but I don't haven't seen a single Republican senator sign on to that standalone bill. There's something t being talked about in the compromise House uh, immigration bill um, that's minor. I don't think it's it will be that effective, but um, that's what I'm hearing. So I don't. I would urge you to continue to do everything you're doing, and and, and continue to to ha you know to urge your friends in other states, especially, to uh, continue to do what they're doing. But I think it's all the pressure is needed. Um, other people want to chime in on that a lot, James. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, on all of these issues, including family saturation, it's, it's, it's important that we educate ourselves about what's going on, that we educate our friends, family, neighbors, um, especially people who disagree with us in Vermont and out of state, get them to vote. Anybody who didn't vote in the last election is now upset about family separation. Get them to vote in the next election. I mean, that, I mean, it matters. It matters. I'm putting pressure not just on local elected officials, although, I mean, you know, locally, local elected officials can't do a lot about family separation specifically, but a lot of the solutions, a lot of these problems have, you know, and, and their solutions have local roots. And, and so there's a lot of work to engage in a fair and impartial policing policy here in Vermont. Um, uh, not just uh, local, state, and federal policymakers, but, you know, businesses. I mean, we need to be doing all of the things that we're doing and more litigating, I mean, all of that, and, and supporting the organizations that do the work, um, uh, including, you know, here in Vermont, groups like Migrant Justice, uh, including the Southwest Border, or the organizations that are representing um, these, these children and these families and have been for a long time. I mean, all of that. Um, so, yeah. yeah, It would be great to get people from other states to push their senators to sign on to the Keeping Families Together Act, um, which was an uh, initiative of Senator Feinstein, then with Senator Leahy and um, 40 other, uh, 38 other senators, and I believe Senator Sanders is on it as well. I'm not sure exactly when it was, but I think in the 80s, um, I was part of the network, refugee network, network here, and there were families that were hosted, and there were the requirements for how, you know, the what they needed to have here, uh, was very loose. You could have them in the, you know, in your in an extra room, in an extra room, and so forth. But what I want to say was that uh, people would frequently stay here for maybe three months, and then volunteers would drive them over the border to to Canada, and they were received. I mean, this was th with lawyers and all that, and they were received. And uh, I'm wondering if there's anything. Like that, if they, if Canada is rising to the occasion and saying, "Wow, this, 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 this is going on in the U.S., maybe we can offer asylum to some of these people who, are, like the families being separated," or so is Canada in, at all uh, involved with with our our issues now, or willing to step up and. Um, Canada has also changed their laws, um, and so it, it was uh, much harder for people to be able to um, either get into Canada or to be accepted. But then there, you know, but if a person presents and has an a, 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 is able to assert a case for asylum, people are being accepted into Canada. And I know somebody that I was working with who uh, was about to face deportation and wound up uh, being very well welcomed um, in Canada. Actually, didn't even go through that place that you read about in New York, upper New York State, um, but he actually presented at the border um, and he, with his family, and who were all U.S. citizens, um, and they were, he was, you know, housed, they were told exactly what was going to happen, uh, he was granted 18 months to, you know, uh, so he could stay and um, be able to prove his case uh, for asylum, so, you know, I've heard both things about Canada, but I think there, it is still an option for some people. But not, you know, but not economic refugees. It really has to be a true case of uh, uh, needing for asylum, because now, as we know, um, the categories um, and James might be able to speak more. You know, th what uh, Attorney General Sessions has just done to limit people's ability to uh, be granted asylum, and the instruction he has given to immigration judges is, I'm speechless. Um, but you know. Uh, People who are a victim, fleeing uh, domestic violence or fleeing gang violence, um, and there, these are thousands, if not tens of thousands, of applicants who are now in serious jeopardy of being deported and being denied asylum. Yeah, I would just add that the my understanding is that the majority, though, of, of uh, asylum applications in Canada are are being rejected when people come from the U.S. So, 
uh, many people sort of hear the the discourse of Trudeau and others saying we welcome all comers and uh, there's this very rosy picture that's painted, but people are being detained, uh, and many of them are ending up in, in deportation as their asylum applications are rejected. Uh, I don't know, with, with the most recent changes from uh, Sessions, h how that might impact people whose applications could be re uh, rejected in the U.S., whether what, what Canada would say looking at those. I have heard that the word sanctuary used in a lot of situations. This church has talked about sanctuary. Cities... I see a um, store says it's a sanctuary. Is that a naive option, or uh, what's the situation in Vermont or even around the country concerning sanctuaries? Um, I, I can feel that, but other folks can can hop in. Um, the the term means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Um, so uh, there, there's there's no formal definition um, in the context of churches. Oftentimes, it's meant to uh, refer to uh, physical refuge, um, somebody who's at high risk of deportation, whether they have a final order of removal uh, or whether they're out on a condition release and, and they believe that at, at their next check-in they may be detained. Um, uh, we've seen uh, religious communities uh, around the country offer uh, a physical refuge for those people, and that's based on uh, a longstanding ICE policy called the Sensitive Locations Memorandum that agents in most circumstances aren't supposed to come into uh, religious institutions uh, or, or schools for that matter, uh, or, or uh, marches and protests and parades as well. Uh, courts used to be in that as well, and that's been slowly uh, mm -hmm. cleaved out. Um, uh, there are a number of uh, religious communities in Vermont that have considered this. Um, in Essex, uh, several months ago, there was an interfaith conference on sanctuary uh, where there are a number of churches and synagogues present to talk about that. Um, from migrant justice's perspective, this isn't a priority need. Um, nobody's come to us. Uh, we haven't had discussions with any members who say, uh, I, I want to take sanctuary in a church. Um, tell me my options. Uh, it's it's a last case and worst case scenario. Uh, taking sanctuary in a church is is akin to self imprisonment. Um, it, it means that you're choosing to live within four walls, uh, and tragically, uh, many people around the country are are making that decision uh, because the alternative of being deported and separating from family. Uh, is worse, uh, but it's never uh, it's never an option that people want to pursue, uh, and um, uh, it's it's one strategy among many that communities are using to uh, keep themselves safe or mitigate risk, uh, and it's not a strategy that people have particularly uh, chosen in in Vermont. I think we can take a couple more questions, Pam. Yeah. Um, I'm a guardian ad litem. My name is Nancy. And is there any other guardian in the audience? No. OK. And we have, um, it's the state requires that we be present in court when there is a juvenile without a parent acting as guardian. Um, but, and we have contacted, a bunch of us have contacted the federal not the federal, but the overall uh, organization of CASA guardians. And I wonder if there's any way that we can intervene when um, on a child's behalf um, in these kinds of cases. OK, thank you. James, I think Sweet. she's asking about you know whether or not to be able to be re you know in court representing or helping children in court. In in what court? Immigration in immigration court. Yeah. Three, 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 three more people want to ask. It's not a requirement. An and, and immigration court is a specific court. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as federal court. It's a very specific okay. court, specific judges. I know. I mean, I think you either have to be a, a barred attorney or an. I think they have accredited representatives. Yeah. 
Um, so I guess theoretically someone who could become an accredited representative, it's usually through an organization like Esperanza Human Rights Project, working there almost like a paralegal. But so I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that would be quite the same thing. And the immigration court for Vermont is in Boston. There, there, there was a clinic right, working here in Vermont with uh, those that had children who are U.S. citizens in case they were, the parents were deported who were undocumented and then um, there'd be documents ready for someone to, um, to take custody, legal custody. So that's being done. Um, I know I've been yeah. an interpreter. Uh, yeah. That's being done through uh, Vermont Legal Aid in Burlington. So we'll have one more question and then begin to wrap up our time together. It seems that there's a distinction between agricultural workers who have seasonal rights to work in the country and Vermont dairy workers who don't. Is there any way, Will or Susan, that that inequity could be addressed? Senator Leahy keeps trying, and um, you know Will can talk about this as well. And there's, again, another bill that um, both Senators Feinstein and, and Leahy and others uh, have been trying to get through, which is a, an ag jobs bill that would create an appropriate uh, visa for all agricultural workers. Um, so right now, you're absolutely right. Uh, dairy, because dairy farm workers are needed year round, they're not seasonal. So they're not like people who come to pick apples, um, which is seasonal work. So there is a real uh, uh, visa for for those workers, but there is nothing, and that's what Will was saying before. Uh, there's no way to for a farmer to do it r the right way and have somebody come through legal process. There is no legal process for that. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Susan. Oh, sorry. Uh, and and I would add to that as well. Um, I think there there are um, human rights centered solutions to that, and then there are industry centered solutions to that. Uh, and one thing that um, Migrant justice really strongly opposes is um, the expansion of uh, this seasonal visa program to cover dairy, uh, and the reason for that is uh, one: uh, for many, uh, I mean, for uh, much of U.S. agriculture, uh, even when it's seasonal, even when seasonal agriculture visas are an option, uh, those industries are relying on undocumented workers regardless. Uh, but two. Uh, any visa that ties somebody's presence in the country to their employment status is a recipe for exploitation and abuse. In essence, it's saying to the worker, uh, if, if you speak up, if you advocate your, for yourself, uh, if you uh, defend your rights and you're fired, then that means you're deported as well because your visa is tied to your employment status. Uh, and so we would see the extension of, agri of, of these H-2A visas, uh, which is not what Susan is talking about. She's talking about a different uh, solution. But uh, what many people are talking about and, and what uh, the Republicans are talking about is uh, saying, oh, yeah, dairy industry, we, we, can, we can get you documented workers, uh, but that would, be a, that would be a tremendous loss for workers' rights and their ability to organize. And I think if H2A did exist for dairy workers, we wouldn't see uh, a program like Milk with Dignity in Vermont, which is transforming conditions for farmers and farm workers, uh, because there would be such a strong disincentive to organize. Great. I just, um, I'm gonna just add one more thing. Uh, all these questions and this meeting because of refugees and once you said, I, I have an experience about what, what, what you got in the past. And I see myself, you know, what, what challenge you have. And sometimes I, I, you, you can say I'm the master and I, I accomplished something. But at the end, you figure out uh, there's a lot out there. They have many thousands of problems. So... I came by myself. My family, all, all are elder over 18, so I cannot bring someone. Now I'm living here four and a half years. Also, I'm married, my wife's there. So 
think about all those problems and please support us. Thank you. Just a moment, I'm going, going to invite Pam Walker from CV RAN to, to share some closing words for us. And just want to thank again Susan, Lori, Tunsain, El Tayyab, Will, and James for being on our panel this evening. Let's give them one more round of applause. And thank you to all of you for being here, for dedicating a Friday evening to trying to understand and to grapple with these ongoing and incredibly complex issues um, that for many people are rapidly changing and, and causing uh, a lot of pain um, and struggle. And, um, and your involvement, obviously, is, is really crucial to continuing to improve these circumstances. Pam, you have some closing words for us. Just final wrap up. Thanks again, everybody, for being here. And uh, it's been an immense, uh, immensely gratifying evening. And when you look around, and there's a lot of us turned out for this very, very important topic, and our hearts have been moved, I know. Um, CV RAN, Central Vermont Refugee Action Network, uh, we're a young and growing organization, and we're welcoming members. We meet the first and third Thursdays. Um, of every month at five over at uh, Trinity Methodist Church. And we have a lot of projects. Uh, we have great ideas and vision. We just need uh, more people to kind of help us um, fulfill all of these uh, ideas and dreams that we have. So um, over in this table, you'll see uh, information about CV RAN if you're interested. I'll take a brochure and um, you'll find out we have a website and we have a Facebook page that we're always working on. And Diane, what else should I cover? Um, there's also information from the other. Um, yes, there's a literature table, I believe. Um, ACLU brought some materials. Migrant Justice brought some. Everybody did. So it's right over there, uh, just near the CV RAN uh, table. And please um, help yourself to refreshments, because we have a lot of good stuff here. If you have questions that didn't get answered, I know there were a few. Um, I hope our panelists will be willing to stay around for a few minutes. So many thanks again to Colin McCaffrey for the sound and for his beautiful music, and to everybody else.